Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining our event today. My name is Sharad Thaxton, and I'm a professor of law and the faculty director of the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy here at the UCLA School of Law. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Promise Institute for Human Rights, the Critical Race Studies Program, and the David J. Epstein Program of Public Interest Law and Policy. On behalf of all the co-sponsors, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. Now, I am truly honored for the opportunity to moderate this amazing collection of panelists here to discuss the topic of reparations. Because their bios are very, very impressive, and therefore by extension, very, very lengthy, I will be necessarily brief with my introductions, but I do encourage you to locate their more detailed and thorough biographies on their respective websites. So first, let me begin with Dr. Uh, Secretary Shirley Weber. Dr. Weber was sworn in as California's 30th Secretary of State earlier this year. Secretary Weber is the first African-American Secretary of State in California and only the fifth African-American to serve as a state constitutional officer in California's 170 year history. Now immediately prior to becoming Secretary of State, Dr. Weber served in the California State Assembly for eight years representing the 79th district which encompasses San Diego, southeastern San Diego, excuse me, and the surrounding area. From 2019 to 2020, Secretary Weber served as the California Legislative, I should be chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus. While in the assembly, Dr. Weber was the principal author and sponsor of Assembly Bill 3121, which established a task force to study and develop uh, proposals for reparations for African Americans for slavery in California and in the United States. AB 3121 was passed by the California legislature and signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom on September 30th, 2020. Before joining the assembly, Secretary Weber was a professor at San Diego State University, where she helped establish the Africana Studies Department as well as serve as its chairperson. I am especially proud to remark that Secretary Weber is a triple Bruin, earning her bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees here from UCLA. Secretary Weber, welcome home. Next, uh, Dr. Brenda Stevenson. Uh, uh, professor Stevenson is the Nicole Family Endowed Chair in the Department of History and a professor of African-American studies at UCLA. She also served as chairperson of the History Department and the Interdepartmental Program in African-American Studies. She is a social historian whose work centers on gender, race, family, and social conflict in America and the Atlantic world from the colonial period to the late 20th century. Professor Stevenson's research has garnered numerous prizes and accolades. Next, we have Professor Devin Carbato. Professor Carbato is the Honorable uh, Harry Pregerson Professor of Law at the UCLA School of Law and the former Associate Vice Chancellor of Buren X for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. He teaches constitutional law, criminal procedure, and critical race theory and criminal adjudication. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and writes in the areas of employment discrimination criminal procedure, implicit bias, constitutional law, and critical race theory. Professor Corbato has also won numerous awards for his teaching, scholarship, and service to the legal profession. Finally, we have uh, Professor Cheryl Harris. Professor Harris is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the UCLA School of Law. She has served as faculty director for the Critical Race Studies Program at UCLA Law School, as well as the chairperson of the African American Studies Department. She teaches constitutional law, civil rights, employment discrimination, critical race theory, and race conscious remedies. Professor Harris is one of the founding and foundational scholars of critical race studies, and her scholarship lies at the intersection of racial theory, civil rights practice, politics, and human rights. Her current research investigates the historic and current relationship among race, debt, and property, and how the creation and management of debt is part of the broader mechanisms of racialized dispossession. Her teaching scholarship and service within and outside of the academy, as well as within and outside of the United States, has garnered her considerable awards and recognition. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, our panelists. Now, I don't want to talk for much longer uh, because like you, I'm eager to hear the many wonderful things our panelists have to say. But I do wanna take a few moments to provide some context for the ensuing discussion. 
Now, those of you who are even remotely familiar with my teaching and research know that I tend to think quantitatively and like to provide a bunch of statistics in an effort to help better anchor broader concepts to concrete facts. Uh, I'll stay true to form uh, with my remarks. Now, the topic of reparations for slavery is not new, uh, but one would be hard pressed to find a time over the past two generations when it has been as widely discussed as it is today. At the national level, a congressional panel held a hearing two weeks ago on whether and how to provide compensation for America's history of slavery and racial discrimination. That proposed legislation, HR 40, would create a commission to study the history of slavery in the United States and the American colonies from 1619 to 1865. The commission would also make findings and recommendations. Secretary Weber provided testimony at that hearing, as well as UCLA law professor Tendai Achume. Now, President Biden has backed HR 40. It's interesting, this legislation was first uh, proposed in 1989 by Representative John Conyers and was re uh, reintroduced every legislative session uh, since. Now, that's at the national level. At the local level, many of you may have heard that the city of Evanston, Illinois is set to become the first U.S. city to compensate Black Americans for the loss of generational wealth due to slavery, funded by a 3% tax on legal uh, recreational marijuana sales. The total payout would be around $10 million and would go to eligible residents of Evanston with payments of around $25,000 each slated to, uh, payments slated to start the spring. Now, reparations can be viewed as an umbrella term that actually covers three distinct racial injustices for Blacks in America. Reparations for slavery, reparations for nearly a century long Jim Crow regime after slavery, and reparations for ongoing discrimination against Blacks in the pre-civil rights uh, post-Jim Crow era. Now, to be sure, these racial injustices, these periods are interconnected and layered, so the subsequent injustice uh, and discriminatory system is built upon the prior one, but the scope and the magnitude of the harms may differ. Okay, I said I was a numbers person. Let's talk a little more about the actual numbers. So now the compensation for slavery, if we use 40 acres and a mule, something that our panelists will talk about that uh, they're using that benchmark, the total compensation is somewhere between 2.3 and $5 trillion uh, in, current, in current dollars. Now, if we base the compensation on the values of slaves at the time of, Af uh, of emancipation, which is actually greater than the 40 acres and a mule that was promised, the number is somewhere between 14 and $17 trillion. And that's just if we focus on the number of enslaved Blacks in 1865, which is around 4 million, right? And not prior generations dating back to 1619. So economic historians have noted that during slavery, black bodies were worth more than the combined value of all of the industries in the United States, uh, except for agriculture, or I say the American colonies, and then obviously eventually the United States. So again, worth more than all of the other industries combined, except for agriculture. Now, and again, some numbers might be helpful. The value of all enslaved blacks in America in 1860 was about $3.5 billion. Uh, again, that's in 1860 dollars. At the time, the agricultural uh, wealth was about $6.6 .6 billion. And again, to put the value of, of, of again, slave uh, labor into context, before the Civil War, 75% of the nation's millionaires were in the South, and nearly all of them were slave owners. Again, 75%. All right. And now this was largely because the values of slaves in 1850s grew by 40% whereas the value of non-slave wealth only grew by 25%. So that was talking about, again, slavery, uh, reparations for slavery. I mentioned a uh, second form of reparations would be uh, the Jim Crow era. Now, for the second claim, this compensation for Jim Crow, the estimated value of just market discrimination, uh, labor market discrimination against Blacks from 1929 to 1969 that gave unjust rewards to whites have been estimated around 1.6 trillion. And it doesn't include housing market discrimination and education discrimination, which would dramatically, uh, dramatically, excuse me, increase that amount. Now we think about this final claim, kind of ongoing post Jim Crow discrimination. What we know is it's more difficult to quantify economically uh, this economic harm, but I'll emphasize that a recent study conducted by Citibank 
uh, reported that racial discrimination against blacks over the last 20 years resulted in a loss of $16 trillion in GDP, gross domestic product. Now this $16 trillion figure is not insignificant. By comparison, the total US GDP in um, 2019 was about 19 and a half trillion, okay? Now, recall that Evanston's reparations plan recognized the need to compensate blacks for the loss of generational wealth due to slavery. This is important because the economic harms of slavery and related systems of racial oppression and domination are still evident today. So, okay, what do we know about race and wealth in America? Sadly, we don't know much before 1990 because the federal government didn't collect or at least didn't admit to collecting much data on wealth, just collected data on income. But we know a lot more in the past 30 years. So focusing on wealth is more um, important than focusing on income because a middle-class income doesn't guarantee middle-class economic security the way middle-class wealth does. This is because the income to wealth relationship for whites is actually pretty strong, but not for blacks. Again, some numbers. Each $1 of income for whites leads to about an increase of $5.20 in net worth. But for blacks, each $1 in income leads to only about 70 cents increase in wealth. Now, this is largely because um, initial wealth disparities. It's easier to turn income into wealth if you start off richer. And this is what whites have been able to do. Now, this is why the median white household with a head of household that is a high school dropout has much more wealth than the median black household with a college educated head of household. So it's $82,000 in wealth for the median uh, white uh, high school dropout relative to $70,000 in wealth for the median uh, black household who's college educated. And it's important because the best predictor of one's wealth is one's grandparents' wealth, not their own job, Okay, not their parents' wealth. And as much as 80% of lifetime wealth can be attributed to gifts from one generation to another. And again, put this in context, about 25% of today's wealth can be explained by the wealth distribution at the time of the end of the Civil War. Now again, not all of this is based upon slavery, but a lot of it was. And we know over the next 25 years, nearly $70 trillion will be passed down from one generation to the next. Again, some more numbers. In 2019, there was about $107 trillion of total wealth in the US. White households owned about 91 trillion of that, or about 85% of that wealth, whereas black households owned about 4.6 trillion, or about 4% of that wealth. Now, whites compromise about 70% of the nation's population, whereas blacks compromise about 13%. Now, the net worth of the median white family in the United States is about $116,000, whereas the median wealth uh, for the black family is about $1,700. So again, $116,000 versus $1,700. That's total wealth. If you look at liquid assets, that is cash, stocks, bonds, the median net worth for whites is about $23,000 and for blacks it's merely $200. A recent study by the Institute for Policy Studies noted that if the average black family wealth continues to grow at the same pace that it has over the last three decades, it would take black families 228 years to amass the same amount of wealth that black families have today. And that's just today, not to equal what whites would have in 228 years. Okay, so why are understanding these numbers so important when thinking about reparations? Let's circle back to AB 3121, the California Reparations Bill. The language of the bill, in the language of the bill, it explicitly recognized the enduring effect of slavery on systemic structures of discrimination on African-Americans and society as a whole in the United States. That is, following slavery, federal, state, and local governments perpetuated, condoned, and profited from the exploitation of African Americans, which has led to debilitating economic, educational, and health hardships for African Americans. Hopefully these numbers illuminate empirically the legacy of slavery in the lived experience of the African American community in the United States. Okay, now with that, I'd like to turn to our panelists. Again, I'd like to start with um, Madam, Secretary, Madam Secretary Shirley uh, Weber. Uh, again, Madam Secretary uh, was the principal author and sponsor of AB 3121. Uh, so Madam Secretary, can you describe AB 3121 and its functions, as well as your motivations for authoring and sponsoring the bill? I would also ask, uh, could you tell us about maybe what some of the biggest challenges you faced with getting the landmark legislation enacted, and what do you anticipate to be the most significant challenges moving forward? 
And finally, if you don't mind, would you mind providing some reflections on the recent HR 40 hearings, as well as your thoughts on why do you believe you were able to be successful with AB 3121 when um, similar uh, that uh, there was not, uh, you didn't have that success uh, in Congress over the last 30 years. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to be here. It's always good to be among the Bruins again. I don't get a chance to get to UCLA very often. Uh, having had spent so many years there, um, I, I know it took me a while to come back because uh, you kind of go through withdrawal when you graduate after going through so many changes in the grad program. But I'm honored to be here uh, as the author of AB 3121, which is the California Reparations Bill to form the task force on reparations. and. Um, I'm going to try to take many of the questions you've asked and, and put it into uh, some organized presentation so that hopefully I'll get a chance to answer most of, most of the things that were there. You know, the, the federal government has been trying to do uh, reparations for uh, many, many years. I think maybe close to 40 years we've been involved in this reparations issue. Every year, Kanye's bringing up the bill. Every year, people are not feeling that they should do it. And it goes on and on. And so, um, Last year, uh, uh, in, well, in 2019, at the 400th anniversary of African Americans in this country, uh, there was a resolution at the Capitol concerning us supporting, once again, H.R. 40 uh, and the reparations at the, at the federal level. So we did uh, pass a resolution saying we are in support of that. Um, uh, I, I think resolutions are important, but sometimes they become meaningless because we do so many of them. And, uh, and unless there's some action attached to it, it's just once again, another statement and a high five without anything else that goes with it. So as a result of that, I went to the caucus and said, you know, I'm going to introduce a California bill to deal with reparations in California. I said, we've waited long enough for the federal government to do what it needs to do. And it's real clear that they're not going to move very fast. And, uh, but I think we can get this done in California. You know, the kinds of things that I've been doing in terms of uh, uh, police reform and, uh, and uh, education reform and those kinds of things and, and kind of laying the groundwork and, 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 and pushing uh, 1460, the Ethnic Studies Bill in the state of California, those kinds of things, uh, we've been laying the groundwork for hopefully sensitizing the legislature to the fact that they can do things and they should do things that are different and that we should move forward. So I introduced the reparations bill and um, uh, interesting, I hate to say it was so easy to get through, it's unbelievable, but it really was. Uh, we didn't have long battles. I'm not even sure if there were any no votes. I'd have to go back and look. But we got overwhelming support in, in, in our House uh, in a bipartisan manner and the same way in the Senate. Uh, in my conversation with the governor, uh, he was very happy to sign the bill uh, because it put California out there in front to deal with the issue of race and gender and dealing with the issue of, of slavery in, in California and the devastating impact of it. Um, you know, we often uh, don't look at California as that place where it, it should be involved in reparations. And yet, uh, that's mainly because we haven't really studied the full history of California and understand the things that were there. So I, I remember when I first went to the legislature at the time, Governor Jerry Brown, uh, almost in every presentation he ever did on uh, either on uh, Martin Luther King Day or during Black History Month, whenever he was invited to come, he always quoted the first governor of California and talked about how racist the first governor of California was. I mean, he studied the governors and he became across some, some quotes and some statements and some activities in the legislature that really made uh, the first governor of California one of the most racist governors in the United States. And we never think about that because we think California is so far away and that it was not impacted by it. And so this AB 3121 is designed to establish a task force. And, uh, and it's written in a way that it does not say we want to determine if there was impact. The bill says we want to determine the, 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 how much impact it had, the depth of the impact it had on African-Americans, and, and then to make recommendations as to how we need to repair the damage that's been done. And, and that becomes important because, um, you know, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out is there, is there not, and those kinds of things. We, we have come to the resolution, the, the, the position we have taken, is that it, it, there has been devastating impacts uh, on California. Uh, the Black Caucus, we argued when the death of, uh, of George Floyd was really a direct result of, of slavery in this country. And the fact that um, uh, we have seared our hearts towards the humanity of Black people and that we could actually see a person uh, being uh, killing a person on the streets and people watching it 
and not feel a sense of awe of, of, of outrage initially until it becomes, until we raise the issue. But when it's occurring, the officer himself had no real sense of humanity or no real feel for the person he was, he was snuffing his life out of. And so that is a direct result of, of slavery, a direct result of dehumanization, a direct result of three fifths of a person, a direct result of not believing that there, as, as Tony said, there was anything about a black man that a white man should respect. Uh, and so as a result, we end up with this, co this country, regardless of where we, we are, that has actually as a nation has seared its heart and mind towards this. So we formed the task force. And we're in the process, in fact, I was on the phone this, uh, this morning talking about uh, individuals who want to be on the task force and uh, talking with some of those who are making recommendations about who should be on it and those kinds of things and securing a budget, which we have, are securing a budget um, ask in, in the legislature in our budget this year that will basically accommodate uh, the whole discussion and the study and the recommendations that come forward. So we were, we were pleased in California to be able to pass this uh, resolution 3121 in a bipartisan manner, Democrats and Republicans uh, supporting it. And uh, I've had several of my Republican colleagues to send me materials from the areas way up north where they were underground railroads and there were uh, le various levels of discrimination in the mining fields and what have you that existed in California uh, at, its, at its time. Uh, California, interesting, like I said, its history is, is often not well known and people just assume that slavery was only in, on the East Coast. Uh, but be, when between the time California became a statehood in 1860, 1850 and the end of slavery in 1865, uh, it was supposed to be a free state. It was supposed to be a state that we called a free state that did not trade and did not allow slavery. Uh, and, but it was that on name only because in all of its laws, its mun municipal laws, its state authorities and others uh, clearly were supporting the enslavement of African-Americans in a variety of ways and the destruction of African-American families and, in, in terms of slavery itself. Uh, it's interesting that the California legislature, when you read the bills that came out of the legislature, authorized sub Southern slaveholders to hold uh, persons in bondage. So long as they enter the state with their enslaved property, they could do that. Uh, we could, they could actually, in 1852, California um, adopted one of the harshest fugitive slave laws in the nation. Uh, it forced the self-emancipated persons living in California back into the chains of enslavement. I, I think the Archie Lee case showed where there was a, a, a fugitive slave who'd come all the way to California and, 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 as, and it was a historic case uh, in, in Archie Lee where he was, he was actually ordered and back to, into slavery and returned to his slaveholder uh, by California authorities. Uh, so we have clearly the, 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 the idea that it was there. And even we develop a so-called a, a forced labor uh, bill that the contract labor that was somewhat of a bogus contract labor bill because it was really the use of slaves and slaves in California to help to build California's infrastructure and uh, and hold people in bondage in California. Uh, we've had a bill in the past that dealt with uh, insurance. In fact, it is believed that 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 the insuring of slaves really built the insurance industry in California. And so our our, our commission on insurance is, has has pulled out all of the all of the contracts and, and uh, insurance policies uh, where slaves were basically insured in California, kept and insured in California. And California and the, in, and the um, insurance industry made significant money on that. And that was before uh, whites insured themselves, they insured slaves. And so the, the slave, so the insurance companies uh, made quite a bit of money in, in, in basically insuring slaves for their, whole, for their uh, captors. Uh, so the history of slavery and discrimination in California is, uh, and nationally, is uh, oftentimes this, uh, seen as something that's in the past and that it has no, no present. But we, we argue that the attitudes that fueled slavery were the same attitudes that fueled the Jim Crow laws, the Black Codes, uh, that fuels the mass incarceration of African Americans, and fuels the police violence against African Americans more than any other group. Um, the attitudes that considered as three-fifths a person are the same attitudes that fuel Southern poll taxes, segregated facilities, uh, re redlining in California, and currently fuel policies such as uh, discriminatory gerrymandering uh, in terms of political outcome. Uh, we discovered that, uh, you know, that, the, that uh, this bill that I just passed in terms of use of lethal force, uh, we eliminated and basically um, 
uh, allowed people to shoot uh, individuals in the back. And that had to do with basically fleeing slaves. Uh, uh, the belief that a slave could run, it just running itself made him obviously a felon in their mind. And as a result, allowed them to be shot in the back. And that, and that bill was only changed about three years ago, that law that does not allow you to shoot a person in the back simply because you think they're a felon, not that they have committed any felony. And if there are no harm to anyone surrounding them, they could not basically be shot in the back. And that changes the law that was 150, 160 years old. Um, it is interesting that when we begin to look at the, the, the things that have occurred in early attempts by African-Americans uh, to attain wealth and other um, things of enjoyment were often met with violence. We often talk about what happened in Oklahoma and the red summers of 1919, but we also have to talk about what happened in Allensworth here in California, a black town that was formed and, and uh, was thriving and, and prospering. And, uh, and of course, Allensworth mysteriously died, supposedly hit by a car in Los Angeles. But, um, but in addition to that, they stopped the trains going to, into Allensworth. And only in the last 10 years or so, uh, 15 years, that the trains now stops in Allensworth to let tourists off to see Allensworth, the black town. But they stopped the train to Allensworth, which made it impossible for the people in Allensworth to get their crops to market. And as a result, had to abandon basically uh, many, of the act many of the activities that occurred in Allensworth as supposedly the black town that was going to provide economic development for African-Americans in California. Uh, and, um, and as a result, they, they killed off pretty much so the, uh, the impact of the economic development in Allensworth. You know, the governor uh, in California, uh, when we begin to talk about data and look at statistics, we have to recognize that the impact of, uh, of uh, the laws that have existed, redlining, uh, the gerrymandering, uh, and, uh, and the lines that, that uh, the covenants and housing that refuse to allow people to own property in certain areas, uh, clearly uh, are, are reflected in, in the economic development and the reality of, of African-Americans. Uh, we make up only 8% of California's population, uh, yet we make up 43% of the homeless population in California right now are Black people. Uh, so when you begin to ask those questions, and we've seen a continuing decline in home ownership in California, um, we, when we look at the uh, population of, of African-American males in the state, uh, we account for we're only 5.6% of African-American males in the, in the state of California, yet we are 29% of those who are incarcerated. Um, and so the, the prison system uh, is, is, is a part of that. Uh, there's a bill we have now in the legislature that's trying to get the constant, trying to get um, slavery taken out of California's constitution in terms of incarceration for the re as, a, as a form of enslavement that has been justified and, and accepted. So we see a lot of a breakdown in these areas that are there. The task force will, as I said, will, will eventually, it's, it's in the process that there've been some nominations already. The task force will be formed. We will have it up and running by January, I mean, excuse me, June of this year uh, with this first task, of course. And there are nine individuals on that task force. There will be two by the speaker, two by the president pro tem, and five individuals selected by the governor. Uh, we anticipate, uh, we've, I've approached the University of California in hopes that they will take a lead role in the research and the, and the support of this uh, effort. I've talked with your current president new president to make to help them understand that implementation of reparations in California could be a feather in the cap of the University of California with all of its massive uh, research institutes and, and resources in terms of dealing with, with, with that. Um, we are, you know, California has, uh, and the nation has often given reparations to everyone. Uh, we've seen it address the grievances uh, uh, through reparations Native Americans for the theft of their land, uh, Japanese Americans who were unjustly in, in turn, uh, the Marshall Plan for European Jews uh, received reparations for the Holocaust. Uh, during Obama's era, I forgot how many, was it $50 million were given to some Jews in New York because they felt they were poor and they should not have been poor, but were poor because of the Holocaust. Uh, so, so Obama gave $50 million to them. Uh, and we see this as a part of, of what the California does and what the nation does. And yet the only persons that people have never felt they owed anything to was African-Americans. Uh, despite the fact that we were brought here, uh, suffered the most in terms of, of, of grievances with regards to not only just loss of, of, of labor and resources, but more importantly, loss of heritage and identity for generations in terms of uh, not knowing one's real name, not knowing one's legacy. Uh, most of us don't know where our ancestors were. We now have DNA that helps a little bit, but it was not due to any record keeping or any 
engagement by this country in, in believing that we were humane individuals. So we have, we believe that California is the fifth largest economy in the world. It is the richest state, not just in the, in the union, but in the world, not just in that sense. It is the largest, most populous state in the, in the US. And as we try to wait for the federal government to do HR 40, and, and, and I went to the hearing on that, um, it will be interesting to see uh, if California once again leads the way in terms of dealing with reparations. Um, at the hearing that took place, it was interesting because the traditional um, two people who are always opposed to uh, reparations were there. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and it's always interesting to me that they always turn out to be athletes. Uh, that, that, you know, they don't turn out to be our, our self-made millionaires, but they turn out to be athletes who come and, 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 and have a real sense of, um, I guess, appreciation for being in this country, uh, despite any challenges they may face. They don't still don't see the ordinary challenges that are there. And they really don't even, unfortunately, don't see how wealthy they would be if they were white and athletic as they are. And uh, that there still is a Jim Crow existence for black athletes. Uh, that they're not as wealthy as their white counterparts, even though they may be more talented. And, uh, and so I, I find it ironic that there are those who, who do that. Uh, this is not an effort to enforce anything, as I tell everybody on anyone, that any black person who doesn't believe they deserve reparations should not get it, uh, you know, uh, and they should move on. And yet there are generations and generations of folks who have been harmed, who don't have the wealth that others have, and continue to live under the guise of the fact that there's injustice and inequality in California. Uh, I was uh, uh, in, in a recent uh, discussion concerning um, uh, the death penalty with the, and the governor basically uh, uh, quoted what was, was done in, smart, in, uh, in Just Mercy when he says, it is, it is better to be rich and guilty than to be poor and innocent, uh, which means that clearly black folks are, wake up, are born in this world with a, a guilty stamp on their face uh, a, a sense of apprehension, and mainly because of slavery that has not died down. And those who say we don't, they, they were not slaveholders themselves, which may be true, but they benefit from whatever slave system has existed that has given them an advantage, uh, whether they go to college or not, it's given them an advantage over African Americans, and they can't even give back their, uh, their privilege. If they wanted to get rid of white privilege, no white person can actually give it back because it's something that's given to them by the system that is ingrained in the system. And it's impossible for them to say, I don't want to be white anymore. Because even if they don't, someone's going to make them white by the advantages they give them, even when they don't recognize they're being given. So we're excited about um, reparations. The task force will be formed. Hopefully we will come out with some recommendations and a budget to accomplish it and to really be able to demonstrate the depth of the damage done. Uh, some have asked me, do I want money? Do we want this, want that? I, you know, I, I, I know that what they're doing in, in, in um, Indiana would not work in California because you can't even buy a garage in California for $25,000. So, uh, you know, uh, that, that is not going to basically create any sense of equity here. Uh, but we can begin to ask questions about our institutions that, that, uh, that should be supporting African-Americans, whether it's the banking industry, whether it's our universities that should be admitting more students uh, because of the damage done to them over for generations and generations of, of, of a lacking quality education. Uh, uh, we should probably be looking at a plan that, uh, that will, that will uh, exist as long as there lacks parity in terms of California and between blacks and whites, uh, that when we achieve that, then maybe at that point, we will have achieved uh, the reparations that we believe we deserve after being in this country for over 400 years and having the labor of African-Americans taken from them for almost 300 of those 400 years. Uh, so thank you so very much. I look forward to the conversation and the dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Secretary, for your remarks. A uh, very powerful remarks you have given a lot of great information uh, and some questions, I think in, in comments, I'm sure uh, your remarks have generated and we want to, uh, we would definitely be returning to those in uh, the discussion section. Uh, now I want to turn our uh, <clears throat> move to uh, Professor Brenda Stevenson. Uh, Professor Stevenson, you know, AB 3121 expressly notes a connection between slavery and educational harms and hardships experienced by African-Americans. So something that's also mentioned in Secretary Weber's comments. Uh, so Professor Stevenson, could you tell us more about the connection between slavery and education, and in particular the relationship between public school education and access to higher education and its impact on the black community from not only an intellectual standpoint, but also that connection to economics? 
Well, thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to thank um, Secretary, Madam Secretary Weber for um, a tremendous introduction to this topic, as well as, of course, all the work that you were doing to bring this bill um, and this inquiry to not only to the state, but also to the nation and connect it with the globalized effort uh, for reparations for Black people who, in the African diaspora, um, were subject to slavery and the aftermath of slavery. Um, I'd like to uh, follow up a little bit with talking about what typically is asked of me when um, my students come to my classes at UCLA and ask me, um, what does what I'm talking about, which is the history of African Americans, have to do with where they are, where we are today? And so reparations really is a, a way of getting into that discussion and connecting the past to the present. So what are the racialized legacies that began in the era of slavery and still impact Black people in our nation today? And of course, um, as um, Professor um, uh, Sherrod has told us, Saxon has told us, um, economic repression. The legacy of wealthy white, the of wealthy white Americans or, or, or um, European Americans created by the sale of Black bodies, Black children, and Black labor, and creating an impoverished Black class not allowed to create wealth for ourselves uh, from our own labor. There's always, we've always been at either the bottom of the income ladder or at the top of the unemployment and underemployment spectrum. Um, as um, we heard earlier today, the value of slaves itself, ourselves, or just our bodies, uh, was so much greater than the total um, value of what was invested in banks um, at the time. Seven times the total value of all currency and circulation in the country, 12 times the value of the entire U.S. cotton crop, 48 times the total expenditure of the federal government in, 19, I mean, in 1860. And by 1860, slave labor was producing more than 2 billion pounds of cotton per year, and American cotton made up two-thirds of the global supply. Cotton itself produced by black enslaved people and sharecroppers, because this is the only work that black people could get after the Civil War was over, was the leading national export from 1803 to 1937. All right. So slave trading and slave and slavery itself not only though was the cornerstone, as we've heard from Secretary Weber, of the economy, of the agrarian economy, but of all of the economies that came to be the United States of America. And it was not just the British who brought slaves to the United States, African people in 1619. The Spanish, as part of the Spanish American Empire, brought enslaved people to the United States um, prior to the British. So did the French. The Dutch came in the middle of the 16th century with Black people, so uh, of the 17th century with Black people. So we have this, you know, we share in this legacy, not only from those people who are derived from, you know, um, English colonies, but also all of the colonies that made up North America. And Black people were first brought to California, what becomes California, by the Spanish, you know, um, and those people who enslaved uh, the Spanish people along with the indigenous people at the time. What are the, some of the other um, ramifications, the lasting legacies of um, this racial, racialized legacies from slavery? Of course, political exclusion. We've been talking about voter suppression. It is back at the Supreme Court. Um, it is back in state legislatures just this week and um, in, in the future. Educational equality. Today, the majority of Black children in public schools nationally still attend primarily racially segregated schools. Most black children go to schools that are predominantly black. Uh, most white children go to schools that are predominantly white, all right? And we know, um, you know, it, it, we, st we all still know that separate is not equal, okay? And that is reflected in the inability of black children to get an education that is equal um, to our, um, to equal in terms of our citizenship within this country and it's equal to what other children are getting at the time. Reparations also might address the social, legal, health, and cultural degradation of Black people um, from, again, when Black Africans were first brought to this country um, to now. Um, just in the New York Times this 
um, this morning, there was um, this discussion of, of course, black people not being able to get the vaccination, you know, even though we are predominantly, um, along with Latinx people and indigenous people, um, impaired by COVID-19, we are the people who are not getting um, the vaccination in the same uh, percentages. And uh, of course, also when we look at legal um, implications, as um, Secretary Weber talked about, the laws that were established, you know, at the time that this nation was still um, part of the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, um, the French Empire, those laws and the, uh, not that the laws themselves, but the customs that are derived from those laws are still operative in our criminal justice system today. Think about the 1661 law, for example, that decided that and being brutish slaves deserve not for the baseness of their condition to be tried by the legal um, trial of 12 men of their peers. From the 17th century forward, then we see that black people are not considered equal under the law, should not be. And even though we have the 14th Amendment and we have other laws that address this, the custom itself of not thinking of black people as having um, the, the, the um, as black people not being able to be um, treated equally under the law is still there. Um, and of course, we see that 40, although we're 30% of the national population, we're 40% of the incarcerated population. And this is whether or not we look at men, women, or juveniles, okay? So, um, so that notion of black people not having to be equal under the law um, is still operative in our society today. And then also the other part of that 1661 law, which says, if any Negro or other shall under uh, slave under punishment by his master shall suffer in life, that is, die, or in person whatsoever, shall not be liable. In other words, you could harm a Black person if you were considered um, superior to that person, if you were considered in control of that, should, having the, the, uh, that person was your property or that person was under your surveillance or supervision. You could kill that person. You could literally kill that person and not be found liable for it. And I ask you to think about that, particularly the George Chauvin case is going to begin next week in the murder of um, George Floyd. And we just this week commemorated the 30th anniversary of the beating of Rodney King. So, and I wanna end by saying uh, some of the uh, legacies that are most devastating um, to the black community and historically so are the mythologies that come out of slavery of natural inferiority, physical, intellectual, and moral, all right? Um, those are um, notions about who we are as a people that as Secretary Weber indicated, denies our humanity, right? And that denial of humanity is played out in every aspect of black life in this country and has been so since the beginning of black enslavement in this country um, into today, through our children's lives and their children's lives, um, et cetera. So um, that, those are my opening remarks and I look forward to the discussion later on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Stevenson. Very powerful remarks. Again, a lot of things for us to think about uh, and some topics that, um, that could come up in our, um, that will come up in the discussion uh, portion. So next I'd like to return, uh, turn to Professor Devin Carbato. Now, Professor Carbato, AB 3121 expressly notes the accumulation of disadvantage to Blacks stemming from slavery, and then we could say related institutions, we might want to say slavery and its progeny. Now, the Evanston Reparations Plan also expressly notes this intergenerational transmission of disadvantage, and especially, uh, specifically, focuses on wealth. Right again, this disadvantage to blacks. Now, can you tell us more about the adequacy or lack thereof of um, civil rights uh, and related interventions to address anti-blackness, and um, how this has not only played out historically but also how it relates to the current moment and other practices implicating anti-blackness? 
so happy to do so. Thanks again for uh, the generous uh, introduction for the framing of the conversations, which I thought were terrific, and the comments uh, that have already been made. I think um, Madam Secretary Weber's work in this area has been absolutely extraordinary, and it's changing the terms on which uh, we're having uh, this debate. So I'm really just thrilled and honored to be a part of um, this conversation. Um, Professor Thaxton began by saying um, people who know him well understand that he does not speak uh, outside of naming numbers. Uh, people who know me well uh, might know that I do not speak outside of using schematics. So you'll indulge me as I sort of share just a few uh, slides to sort of um, get this particular uh, show on the road, uh, so to speak. And I am uh, thinking about the idea of racial accumulation and the basic basic observation I think you might all appreciate, which is that racial inequality um, accumulates over time. Racial advantage accumulates over time as well, but I'm going to be focusing largely on um, the ways in which racial disadvantage accumulates over time. And to develop this particular point, I think it might be helpful uh, for me uh, to invoke Martin Luther King in this respect, because there's a way in which King um, is decontextualized vis-a-vis -vis his vision. So we might all remember uh, the March on Washington in which King dreams of um, a moment in which people are judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And you'll have to indulge my articulation of this. It's not quite with a kind of rhetorical elegance that Kim might, uh, King might have articulated it. It's a moment in which uh, King as well talks about black children and white children holding hands in a state of interracial harmony. But it's also a moment in which it's absolutely clear that black people had come to the nation's capital to cash a check. And it's a check that he says uh, comes back marked insufficient fund. So he's literally imagined this is the check. It's to black people. It's a civil rights check. And the problem is that again, it comes back marked insufficient funds. And you can just pause and think about what that means vis-a-vis -vis the story we're telling about uh, on, on compensation for a certain kinds of racial injuries. But what I wanna do uh, in the remainder of the time that I have is to suggest that it might not just be an insufficient uh, funds problem in the, se in the sense that the check bounces, to use the colloquial expression. It might also be a moment in which the check has cleared. So here's the point I wanna try and press and invite you to help me think through. The problem that I wanna um, suggest is that the civil rights check that's been dished out to black people has never ever, ever been enough to attend to the racial inequality problem to which that check has been applied. So the check is cleared, but it wasn't enough. And there's a way to think about this by doing a simple racial math. So this is not the kind of math that again, uh, you would see anywhere near um, the analysis that Professor Thaxton performs. This is simple Devon Carbottle math, which is to say, think fifth grade. So here's the analysis that I have in mind. So imagine that what you have at moment one is racial inequality. No one debates it. Everyone agrees this was a moment of racial inequality. Then you get a civil rights check. The question is whether when you apply that check to the moment of racial inequality, it draws down that inequality to zero, or instead, whether you get some leftover racial inequality. The answer I want to suggest by this simple math is you get this leftover racial inequality. Um, Professor Thaxton's introduction gave you a sense of the numbers. I'm just, again, giving you a sense of the model, that there is always some racial inequality that's left over. You can think about that in very specific ways. Let's start at the very beginning. It's a good place to start with slavery. So slavery is the moment of racial inequality. Few people argue about that. The civil rights check is reconstruction. You apply reconstruction to slavery. Does reconstruction draw down the racial inequality that slavery produced to zero? I think the answer is no. We can debate how much racial inequality is left over, but it's pretty hard to make the argument that reconstruction applied to slavery equals zero racial inequality. We can perform precisely the same analysis with respect to Jim Crow. Again, 
mostly everyone agrees that Jim Crow was a moment of profound racial inequality. Once again, we get a civil rights check. Let's call this time the civil rights check Brown v. Boss of Education. When you apply that civil rights check to Jim Crow, does it draw down the racial inequality to zero? Again, I don't think you can get zero from doing that math. We can talk about post-Brown, massive resistance to Brown. So now we talk about racial discrimination that is rampant. It's not in a Jim Crow form necessarily. Intentional discrimination on the part of the state, intentional discrimination on the part of private actors. Once again, we get civil rights check. We could talk about the Civil Rights Act, 64. We could talk about the Voting Rights Act. When we apply those civil rights check to this particular historical juncture, do we get zero? Answer again is no. And if to borrow from Michelle Alexander, if we talk about the new Jim Crow, this is the moment in which we find ourselves at now. We don't get civil rights check right now. No one's dishing out civil rights check. People are talking about post-racial America. There are no civil rights checks that are being dished out right now. So the point I'm making, I think, is that each moment of racial inequality might have occasioned a civil rights check. The clearing of that civil rights check did not get us to zero. It got us to some racial inequality that we can debate with respect to the amount of, but not the existence itself. More profoundly, the racial disadvantage of which I speak, that the civil rights check didn't properly clear, accumulates over time. And we can think about this by changing the metaphor slightly differently and think of inequality as imposing a weight upon Black people. So Black people carry the weight of racial inequality. So here's the visual that I have in mind here. So slavery produces a weight of inequality, let's say. So imagine that we abolish slavery, we get rid of it, it's eliminated. Does that mean that we eliminate all of the racial equality that slavery produced? The answer quite clearly is no. Maybe we get rid of this weight, maybe we get rid of that weight. But racial inequality remains. There's a weight of racial inequality that survives slavery. The ending of slavery is not the ending of racial inequality. It just doesn't happen that way. It hasn't happened that way. Same story with respect to Jim Crow. You abolish Jim Crow, let's say, it doesn't mean you abolish all of this, you just don't. Maybe again, what you do is you take off this weight and you take off that weight, but racial inequality as a weight in the lives of black people remain. And remember that we have to carry over the weight from slavery. So the scenario might look like this, when you bail the weights that's carried over from slavery and add it to the weight of Jim Crow, obviously this is not a literal representation. I'm just using a heuristic device to suggest the ways in which all of this is carrying on over time. And this accumulation is not just economic, it's not just political, it's not just um, social, it's also discursive. And both Madam Secretary Weber and Professor Stevenson spoke to this. That is to say, there are messages, ideas about black inferiority that accumulate and sediment that makes the disposability of black lives an acceptable feature of social life. So ideas about who we are as a people then travels and accumulates over time, it seems to me. And it's precisely how social meanings of race operate while we might look at this particular image and say, this is an image of non-dangerousness, even though the person is clearly dangerous. We might say as well that this now is an image of racialized dangerousness, even though this might be peaceful protest. And we can think about the insurrection in that regard where white expressions of lawlessness escaped the kind of law enforcement discipline and violence to which black expressions of lawfulness is routinely subjected. We can also think about these as moments again that are read through the social meanings of race and the question about whether black kids can be smart is an enduring um, effect of the social understandings of race that are rooted in slavery 
and that have manifested themselves in the multiple afterlifes of slavery to the contemporary Jim Crow era. Just a few more comments I wanna make about the particular way in which law works in this context, because part of the reason we see racial inequality accumulating in the way that I've described and that maps on to precisely the numbers with which Professor Thaxton began is because the civil rights check that have been dished out have largely been in the form of an injunction, by which I mean it's fundamentally about kind of let's stop slavery, full stop. You can, uh, foot not rather, you can raise a question about whether slavery stopped or whether it continued by other means. And there's a big literature on that point, but let's leave that footnote in footnote and assume that you abolish slavery. What you're doing at that moment is saying, all right, let's stop slavery, but let's not do redistribution. Let's stop Jim Crow, but let's not do redistribution. Let's stop the madness of Brown, but let's not re do redistribution. So each of these are moments in which all we're doing is saying, let's end a particular madness in the precise form in which that madness occurred, or in the narrowest form in which that madness occur, with no leveling of the playing field afterwards. And just to be clear about efforts to level the playing field and the kind of resistance with which they were met. So it's not only that we didn't want to engage in any redistribution, it's also that even efforts that said, well, give us a new injunction. So slavery is over. Give us a new injunction that says you cannot discriminate against us in the context of, let's say, public accommodation. So that was what was at play in 1880s America, where basically a case gets to the Supreme Court where the question is the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Act that prohibited discrimination in the context of public accommodation. This is what the Supreme Court says in the 1880s, when a man has emerged from slavery and by the aid of a beneficent legislation shaken off the inseparable concomitants of that state. There must be some stage in the progress of his elevation where he takes the rank of mere citizen and ceases to be the favorites, the special favorites of the law. So in the 1800s, 1880s, the Supreme Court is articulating black demands for non-discrimination as a handout, as a preference. We're not even talking redistribution here. We're talking no more discrimination, a new injunction we're basically asking for in this particular moment. And the Supreme Court says, just carry on, just carry on. You're asking to be a special favorite. So when we think about the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, where racial mediation is framed as a preference, they're asking for a handout, that is not a new idea. That is an idea that was articulated early to enable racial accumulation in terms of disadvantage of black people and advantages for white people. So as we have this conversation, I think it's critically important for us to keep in mind again, the particular techniques through which that accumulation has occurred and the fundamental problem at the end of the day being that civil rights checks have never cleared the ground to zero. And because they haven't done so, it meant that racial inequality has sedimented and accumulated over time. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Corbato. Again, very powerful remarks, uh, raised many issues that are worth returning to in the discussion. So now I would like to move on to Professor Cheryl uh, Harris. Now, Professor Harris, uh, a common critique from the right and even from some folks on the left is that slavery just happened too long ago to merit addressing now. Now as AB 3121 highlights, the institution of slavery for African-Americans on US soil can be traced back to 1565 in colonial Florida and from 1619 to 1865 in other colonies that will become the US. Now, can you speak <clears throat> about these statute of limitations and temporality arguments and their relevance to litigating reparative racial justice claims with respect to reparations and other types of racial harms caused not only by slavery, but also anti-Blackness more generally. Certainly, and thank you. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to engage this always crucial topic uh, with all of you, my colleagues, Devin and, and Brenda, and especially with Secretary Weber, 
who has been such a clear voice on this and so many issues. So I do want to focus on temporality and the issue of time. And I, I guess I'll just start with the basic point. The argument that claims for redress are out of time has been deployed to reject or disqualify such claims since emancipation. There has never been a time when the legislature or the courts have deemed it the right time for robust reparative justice to address the harms from anti-Blackness. And this has been consistent from the time of the Freedmen's Bureau up through the present, and even with regard to far more modest forms of racially focused remedies like affirmative action. Time has always been placed in front as the barrier. We have never been at the right time. And this has been true. You've asked about litigation, but I also want to point out that this has been also true with regard to legislative remedies. Um, so various strategies, whether it's litigation or legislative remedies, have often encountered the argument that relief can't be granted because of either an actual statute of limitations, which is a legal bar, time bar to um, certain kinds of suits, based on the policy that um, you, need to, uh, you, you need to cut off claims at a certain point for efficiency reasons, for fairness reasons. But it's also been the idea, it's, it's, it's been served up in the context of legislation as well, because the argument is that the time for me remediation has passed or somehow we're outside of the appropriate time limit. So no matter when the claims are asserted, the response has been that um, the event is over, uh, slavery is over. However, to paraphrase the late uh, political theorist, Patrick Wolf, slavery is a structure, not an event, meaning that it's ongoing and it has an afterlife as each of the panelists and as Secretary Weber has already explained. So I wanna begin uh, with pointing out how this argument that redress for slavery has always been deemed out of time um, and how it's been raised as a barrier to show that it's an illegitimate argument. Um, since there's never been a right time uh, that must tell us that the argument is really not about time. It's actually a cover for something else and a way in which the powerful basically ensure that their advantages and the disadvantages that are part of the racial baseline remain frozen in place. So one of the early examples I want to point to relates to the Freedmen's Bureau, as I mentioned. So legal historian Eric Schnapper has pointed out that the debates over the 14th Amendment at the time of its adoption showed that Congress was really about implementing a series of social welfare programs whose benefits were expressly focused and indeed the early versions limited to the freedmen or black people in the initial version of the bill. I should say that the initial versions of the Freedmen's Bureau actually opened up remedies not only to formerly enslaved blacks but to those who were nominally free. Um, he pointed out that these were adopted over the objection uh, that this was unfair to whites. Um, and the Freedmen's Bureau, the initial version got pulled <laughs> for some technical reasons. And a second was proposed, which actually expanded th those who received the remedies from freedmen to white refugees. Um, however, when the 1865 Act was actually adopted and implemented, it focused on the freedmen. Uh, the freedmen were the only beneficiaries of the programs on education, labor regulation, land distribution, a whole host of remedies that were principally focused on them. So although the bill authorized um, inter interventions on behalf of white refugees, the main thrust of the bill was on uh, the freedmen. Um, the bill expired, it required debate over new legislation and this racially focused implementation actually became part of the basis for a very virulent op opposition that the Bureau was benefiting Blacks at the expense of poor whites. Um, President Johnson then vetoed the bill. It was enacted over his veto. But in the course of this, there were certain kinds of arguments that once again invoked this notion of time. And in addition to this idea that whites were being disadvantaged relative to Blacks, um, one of the arguments that was, was uh, raised was, well, how long are we gonna be required to give this kind of relief? Now, mind you, this is 1865. Um, the, the, the country is barely out of the war, and yet the issue of time is already being invoked. Uh, one of the things that's probably a hazard of, of spending as much time talking about these issues as I do with my colleague, Professor Carbato, is I was actually going to cite the very passage that he just pointed out in the context of the civil rights cases, which were decided by the Supreme Court in 1883. But it's worth underscoring 
it, uh, that case was one of the great travesties of the United States Supreme Court, among the many. Uh, and in that case, what the court did was it struck down the 1860, 60, I'm sorry, 1875 Civil Rights Act, which banned discrimination in public accommodations. Uh, and it banned it because it said it was not a proper exercise of Congress's enforcement powers under the 14th Amendment. And to buttress its argument, here again, we see the notion of time when a man has emerged from slavery and by the aid of beneficent legislation, they're referring here to bills like the Freedmen's Bureau, there must be some stage in the process of his elevation where he takes the rank of mere citizen and ceases to be the special favorite of the law. So you already have this notion that get over it. Uh, it, it, it you've already had whatever remedy that you're entitled to. And at this point, you should form the rank of ordinary citizen. Now to be clear, as Devin pointed out, what was at issue in that case was not some form of specific remedial action targeting black people like the Freedmen's Bureau. It was an anti-discrimination law. And it was already being argued that blacks did, should not be uh, allowed to be the beneficiaries of such laws because after all, there must be some stage in the process where they don't need it. Um, so this notion that the time has passed for remediation really continues into the present. Uh, and we have um, two um, very salient examples. One arriving, arising out of Tulsa. Uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race riots of 1921, in which a white mob whipped into a frenzy over false claims that a white woman had been assaulted by a black man over the course of two days, destroyed a prosperous, thriving black community of Greenwood and murdered, um, the speculation is hundreds of people, the records are really unclear, but certainly destroyed the home, uh, killed at least 100 people, destroyed the homes of thousands of black residents with the complicity and the support of state and local elected officials and the police. In 2003, 171 survivors of the massacre and their descendants filed suit in federal court seeking re reparations and it was dismissed by the court due to the application of the statute of limitations essentially saying that it was too late. The relevant law in Oklahoma would have given somebody two years. So even though the Tulsa Race Riot Commission had called for the survivors to receive reparations and called it a moral obligation, the court not only declined to apply the statute of, or apply the statute of limitations, it declined to uh, apply any of the available exceptions. I don't have time to run through them all here, but that there are ways in which uh, the, the clock can be stopped. There's a tolling of the clock available under certain doctrines, under statute of limitations, such as that the government may, or that the wrongdoer may have suppressed knowledge of the wrongdoing, or may have promised to uh, provide restitution, which in effect prevented the plaintiff from going forward. The court rejected all of those, and the Supreme Court accepted the court's decision without comment in 2005. There were efforts uh, to get Congress to remove the statute of limitation prescription from the case, through the Claims Accountability Act, which was modeled after the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which provided relief to Japanese Americans for internment, but the bill has not been adopted. Um, there was a similar fate uh, for suits imposed for more general liability, that is in Ray African descendants, which was a case also filed in the 2000s. That case got dismissed for a number of reasons, but among them again was this idea of the statute of limitations. Um, what I'm would say about this is the arc of these kinds of arguments demonstrates that um, really the basis of the claim is to is not really grounded in a notion that there is in fact um, not that, that this is not the right time. What is really happening here is an attempt to deny accountability and the argument about time is used to obscure the fact that there has been so many have been so many promises unkept. The residue, the constant um, compounding of uh, inequality that all of the speakers have talked about, that is what the time argument is really designed to obscure. And so if we take into account the way that temporality has been misused to bar relief since the beginning, along with the structural features of slavery's afterlife, we can see that claims of redress are in fact not out of time. Rather, America has run out of time to address it. And this is what the point is that, again, King was bringing in the context of the speech of the March on Washington when he talked about the fact that America had defaulted on its promissory note 
um, to which everyone was entitled. This promissory note was, he said, a sacred ob obligation and had given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has been marked insufficient funds. This is what he's saying. This is the promise unkept. And that is why the argument about time keeps returning. I think if we actually look at the history though, we can see that that argument never had any real uh, legitimacy to it. It remains in fact a bar that can in fact be removed um, both doctrinally and by way of legislative action. And I guess I would just say that we shouldn't be deceived by that argument. Uh, it's really about the fact that accountability is, is, uh, is, is central to the picture and it's an accountability that demands, uh, demands attention now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Harris, for those very powerful and insightful remarks. And so, but I do want to open up some dialogue between uh, the panelists, uh, <clears throat> and then I don't, I and mean, if possible, uh, maybe address a question or two from the audience. But that we might not be able to squeeze that in. So I do want you to ask, uh, want the panelists to be able to ask questions of, of one another. But while you're formulating your thoughts, let me throw out a question generally to the uh, to the panelists. I will um, want to give a sec Madam Secretary Weber first opportunity to answer, and then the rest of the uh, panelists uh, can chime in if they should should, um, should so choose. So one of the things that we know right now that we're hearing is about debt cancellation for student loans, right? So the Biden administration has talked about this. Even when we think about uh, the Democratic primaries, what we were talking about at that point, presidents are hopeful Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders talking about cancellation of student debt. <clears throat> and the reason I want to bring this up because obviously it's a very topical discussion, uh, but it's also when we think about it in terms of reparations, you know, in 2013, uh, the Caribbean heads of governments established the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And the mandate of that commission was to prepare a case for reparations for uh, individuals of African descent, as well as the region's indigenous communities who were victims of what they call crimes of humanity, which include genocide, slavery, and slave trading, and racial apartheid. Uh, again, things that all of you have mentioned uh, even myself has discussed, and that's also what happened in the context of, uh, of the American slavery and then Jim Crow and post Jim Crow system. In 2016, the CARICOM uh, Freedom Commission developed a 10 point plan. And again, this was directed at the European nations. One of the plans, and I won't go through all the 10 points, but one of the plans, uh, one of the uh, options on the 10 point plans, one of the demands was debt cancellation. Um, <clears throat> and what they noted was that. Caribbean governments that emerged from slavery and um, colonialism had inherited a massive crisis of community poverty and institutional unpreparedness for development. And it said the governments had engaged in like to the business of cleaning up all the colonial mess in order to prepare for development. And the pressure of development had driven the governments to carry the burden of public employment and social policies designed to confront these colonial legacies. And it this actually resulted in uh, states accumulating unsustainable levels of public debt that constitute uh, their fiscal entrapment. So then they're talking about it at the label, at the level of the nation state and canceling debt uh, for their development. But again, you can make an analogous argument with respect to community development. Uh, uh, Secretary Weber did talk about Allensworth and how that was un um, that development was undermined by stopping the trains that uh, undermined economic development. Again, we can think about Tulsa, Oklahoma. We can think about Rosewood, all these other uh, communities as well. But with respect to debt cancellation, because again, that is something that the Biden administration and uh, has been discussing, as well as I've got some sympathy from our Republicans as well. My question is, um, how do we think debt cancellation um, should factor in to a discussion of reparations for its for slavery and its, its progeny? And I know Secretary Weber did, uh, didn't say there, there had to be a specific plan of quote unquote cutting a check uh, for um, for uh, for the impacts of slavery, uh, but having more capacious understanding about development. But I did want to ask specifically about debt cancellation. Uh, so again, I'll pass that first to uh, Secretary Weber uh, if she wants to address it, and then the panel. Uh, thank you. And and I think all of those things are should be on the table. Uh, one of the things I tried not to do is to prescribe in the bill exactly what it should cover because uh, I don't want to leave anything out. That's number one, and and want to give an opportunity for an understanding of the research and the depth that's engaged in it. Um, but I think what happens, like, like, like 
what is happening even now in terms of uh, the government stepping in and, and providing checks to individuals and so forth and so on, it really emphasizes we can really do anything we want to do if we want to do it. And that becomes real clear. You know, we've argued for years that SATs were unfair and unjust to people of color and, and for admissions into University of California. And in a matter of an overnight experience, it no longer exists. I mean, you know, and so we can do anything we want to do, and whites generally do that when it's to their advantage. And so when we start talking about paying people for things or canceling debt and looking at the injustices that are there and the debt that's borne by African Americans for everything, we can do what we want to do. We're talking about canceling student debt. Uh, uh, those kinds of things are real because they have an adverse effect upon those who went to the universities and the colleges and they end up with a debt and unable to participate in the economic development of the, of the nation. And having those persons out of debt uh, would be an advantage to the economy of California, of, of every nation state. So you can imagine if they think they can't cancel debt, but they really can. Uh, it's, them, it's their money circulating amongst themselves. Um, these things are possible. But if you start talking about canceling debts of black people, then they start getting very, having difficult conversations because in their minds, and this is a, what we have to continue to confront, in their minds, they owe us nothing that we owe them, that we should be, and I've heard them say, we should be glad that we were brought here, that we're better off here than we would be in some third world country. And you hear that even sometimes, I've heard it in churches, which really shocked me. But um, so, the, so the idea is that we have not gotten reparations because people don't believe they owe us anything. Uh, you know, that, that, that us coming here was to our advantage and being here continues in their mind to be to our advantage. So, you know, you'd have to have feel people that they did you wrong in order to want to do reparations. And that's one of our big challenge uh, because they don't believe that they have done anything wrong in enslaving us and, um, and, and then letting us go without anything, without any resources um, and continuing to, to occupy the second class citizen position in this nation. There are no tears for us, you know, uh, when you think about it. Uh, people talk about unemployment rates and yet black people have had double digit unemployment uh, ever since they've been emancipated you know and uh, and we've had the double digit unemployment as long as we've been collecting data and that is the norm for us and nobody cries about it until others experience double digit unemployment and then we think the world has come to an end so i i think that that you know there is no um uh we need to find those programs that are effective uh, that actually work uh, I think the, the brother who was mayor of Stockton started a program and it was reported where he was giving these people $500 a week, uh, unsolicited $500 a week. And he talked about it in that one year, how it actually transformed these people's lives, you know, just by having access to resources and not struggling so hard just to survive and not, and not make, and being frustrated in the process. He said it not only improved their economics, but improved their, op their, their choices of employment and opportunities for employment and their lives and so forth, just by giving them $500 a week, um, which says there has to be a livable wage in this nation. There has to be something that we, that we, that we recognize as minimal, as, some, as many countries do. If you go to Australia, there's a minimum they pe think people need to live. So when we start looking at African-Americans and finding that we're so far down in terms of wealth, we're so far down in terms of, of, uh, of uh, income, uh, and, and those kinds of things, it, 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 you can't get away from the fact that canceling some debts, doing some things, causing us to be, allowing us to be at the universities without having to pay to be there, all those kinds of things would be advantageous to us to basically build a community uh, and, to, and to amass wealth and to begin to compete uh, on the same plane. Uh, and that would be the challenge, but, uh, but we can do anything we want to do. And, and, and that is evident as we consistently change our rules, change who we provide support for, all those kinds of things where if they think it's only gonna benefit us, it's another story, but then they have the capacity to do all of those things in this country. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm pushing it so hard in California, because we are wealthier. If you took California out of the United States, it would lose its standing in terms of wealth. And California is the wealthiest state, not only in the union, but wealthier than, than most countries in the world. And we can do this because we have tremendous wealth, but it is not equally distributed and is not generally given to those who work the hardest. Thank you very much for your answer, uh, Secretary Weber. 
that was a very thorough answer. I don't know if any of the panelists, other the panelists would want to add to that, but I think what um, Sec Madam Secretary's answer revealed is that like, when there is a will, there is a way. And then the fact that we're looking at debt cancellation for students, and many of the proposals have been irrespective of you know, their economic, uh, uh, personal economic standing, uh, that um, <clears throat> again, there can be traction depending on and whether or not, again, there is the motivation. But I would just say, if anyone else, other panelists wants to add, um, uh, please let me know. So <clears throat> then what I'll do, uh, I'll ask Secretary Weber, do you have a question of any of the panelists? <laughs> How do you folks envision um, <clears throat> the university's role in reparations? Do you have, since all of you are at the, at the institutions, what do you see uh, is a role for the university or the black faculty uh, and staff at, at our universities? That's a wonderful question. Um, I've talked a lot, so I want to go ahead and, and uh, pass it on to see who I can tackle it with you first, and then and then other people could add in. I think that it's a it's exactly the question that we should be asking ourselves. Um, we arrive here by virtue of all of the things that uh, we've talked about historically, the struggle to open up the university and specifically the University of California, which I think as Professor, I mean, as Secretary Weber has pointed out, there's sometimes a kind of mythology that hangs over California as being um, a, a state that somehow has a different racial regime than others. And it's true, each region does have sort of different tweaks on, it, on, uh, on a formula, but the basic formula uh, which is one of white supremacy is is still here. And so I think that one of our missions that ought to be is to think about how we can feed into the task force the collective work that we do uh, in terms of thinking about what not only the history, but as uh, Sherrod began with some of the quantification and thinking about its manifestations in the present. I personally would like to focus in on this question of debt. I think uh, Sherrod mentioned it earlier that it has been one of the questions that I have been focused on because I've been looking at the way in which indebtedness remains a feature of how labor and value is extracted from us as a people. Uh, and that certainly was true post slavery. That was the regime we, we went from enslavement to convict labor. Uh, that mechanism rested upon debt debt continues to be uh, very much a factor. And um, I think that one of the things that we can do is to challenge ourselves to think about the ways in which the work we are currently doing can feed into this project, as well as help to train uh, at the next generation of researchers and people to carry this on. Because uh, I do not see this as being something where the task force comes out with some report uh, six months from now or a year from now, and then we can just wrap it up and, and call it a day. One of the things that I think uh, Devin's work and Brenda's work and, and everyone's work actually Marva uh, you know, points out is the ways in which these structures transform and sustain the same relationships. You know, If it's been built up over 600 years, it's not gonna be fixed uh, in a one year kind of uh, window. So I think we, we also can think about how we are training and organizing ourselves in teaching the next generation of people coming along to see this as central to the work that we have to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Corbato? I'll just add very quickly. I mean, I think I think it's a brilliant question and uh, one could easily imagine, I know you said you have begun conversations with the president of the UC, UC system, but there should be a UC reparations project. And that project presumably would have as an entailment, a curriculum a curriculum that is interdisciplinary so that students, no matter where they find themselves uh, studying, they would have to encounter uh, a version of this. There should be a project of translation. I think we all understand that part of the difficulty here is the suppression of knowledge, the lack of knowledge that is going to be a predicate for whether or not reparations ultimately has traction. It's not just um, uh, the case that you can kind of come up with a quote unquote right policy uh, with respect to what forms reparations might take. People have to understand why this is the right time uh, to do it, to riff on the frame that Professor Harris suggested and to push back against, uh, you know, uh, the idea that there is, um, uh, that this is the wrong time. So I think figuring out how the university would occupy a role in public life 
vis-a-vis -vis the dissemination of that information would be a crucial undertaking as well. Thank you very much, Professor Cabado. Um, <clears throat> so we're almost out of time. What I want to do is to try to quickly just shoehorn, <laughs> build it on what Professor Cabado said, and shoehorn one last question for you, Madam Secretary, and it's related to what uh, Professor Cabado and Professor uh, Harris said as well, which is, there does need to be investment from the university. Obviously, you mentioned your conversations uh, with President Drake. Uh, <clears throat> but it's also, so I want to take that and also just kind of relate it to the um, uh, <clears throat> the task force, getting back to AB 3121. And so we know there has actually needs to be appropriations for the task force for it to have the appropriate staff. So this was on a question that was asked for um, one of our, uh, one of our, uh, in, in the Q&A, and one of our UCLA alum, if I remember the name correctly, so this is great, um, UCLA law alum. But the question is, what resources, uh, this is for you, uh, Secretary Weber, what resources do you believe the task force needs to be, uh, to effectively accomplish the goals that you envision? Um, so said in an ideal world, what would those resources be? And what do you think after the task force completes its task, what would then be required to ensure uh, that uh, the, you know, those proposals uh, would be uh, enacted? Well, you know, I think uh, I've, I've asked a number of sources and um, with regards to what, what do we really think needs to, what, what kind of staffing needs to occur for the, for the, uh, uh, for the task force? Because I, you know, I don't, I don't pretend that I, I know all these things because I'm, I'm a legislator and I focus on, on policies and issues and then hopefully put the work to the folks who are the experts in their, all the other different areas. Um, and so we're look, and so there was a, a couple of numbers given two three million dollars or whatever. So it's not a huge amount in in California's budget world. I chaired the budget for a while, and and you know, three four million dollars is what we call budget dust. Okay, uh, you know, billion, you know, hundred fifty hundred seventy billion dollar budget. So, but um, but clearly we we uh, I I consulted with uh, the uh, your. Uh, Institute at, at, at UCLA, uh, the Bunch Institute and some other places in Berkeley and said, you know, what kind of people do we need? And so we talked about having someone who is actually a uh, staff and director to it, as well as other staff, uh, looking at graduate students and making making sure kind of uh, uh, giving them the generally kind of salary that you get as a, as a graduate TA or whatever it may be to, to work on this project. So we, you know, we know that staff has to, that there has to be resources there that are part of it. And, uh, and that after, uh, and, and after uh, a year or two of, of, of the investigation and recommendations, my proposal is going to be hopefully that there be a, a task, that, a, that an implementation group exists at the state level that really is a, um, a, an office of reparations or whatever it is that would basically implement the recommendations that are there. The Black Caucus is prepared to take the recommendations and turn them into legislation and budget items. So we, you know, we plan to take the recommendations and continue to move forward with it and not just drop it and say, okay, we had a year of this, that's that. It may take years for us to actually accomplish what we need to accomplish at every level. You know, so I'm, I'm not thinking that this is going to be something that comes in one year and all, everything is beautiful and we move on. It really requires the diligence and commitment of of, of all of those who are involved in reparations to see this project through, to make sure that the resources are there and available so that California can be, can demonstrate that we can get to some level of fairness and, and, and compensation with regards to reparations. Um, I envision, and, and this is why I, I asked the university because in some ways I'm kind of like the Dubois. I believe there, I believe in the talent at 10. I believe there's a reason why your parents and my parents and whomever fought so hard to get us at these institutions was because these are the citadels of knowledge and but also should be the citadels of change and implementation. And um, and we have to look at it in that way. And so when I see, uh, and I have always seen it this way, when I see uh, African-Americans at universities, I think of resources for the community. Uh, I think of those who can create the, 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 the plans and the knowledge and the implementation, do the analysis, who deal with the data, who deals with the various kinds of things that, that, that the average person up and down the street knows about, has a heart for, but may not be able to articulate it. Um, I envision this, the, the task force as it moves forward through the office of, uh, through the secretary's office, secretary of state, uh, working with the AG's office, who's, who's, has, who's the fiscal agent for it, uh, basically beginning to, um, to offer things across the state in terms of um, hearings that people can see now that we can all do technology 
having the hearings so people can participate, having um, town halls for people to understand the data and the information is there. Because if it is to be a successful project, it requires more than just black people believing in it. It requires a commitment from the state that this is something that has to happen, that they've seen the data, they know what it is and they know what the results can be. And so my, my task is since, you know, I'm in charge of the archives to make sure the archives are available in terms of all the information that's there, but also the programming of the archives and the museums in California to basically uh, begin to share this information across the state so that people know that this is not just Shirley Weber, it's not just you folks that, who are saying that this is some data, this is some information that's there. I would hope that the, that the brain trust of California, which is I think of black scholars, uh, those in the institutions and those outside the institutions would be the ones who can hopefully articulate this issue, bring it forward and continue to monitor it as it moves forward. Um, that is it, it, because this is this is 400 years, 401 years now. Uh, uh, it will not be solved in one year, but it can be solved in a reasonable amount of time if we actually are committed to putting the resources there. I don't expect to, you know, I expect my grandchildren to benefit from uh, reparations. I don't expect my great, great grandchildren to have to wait for it uh, if we're serious about what we're doing. Um, and uh, so that's my, you know, that's my vision of it. And that's why when I go to the universities, I say straight up, you know, hey, uh, your mama, my mama, your daddy, my daddy basically struggled and did what they had to do to get us through these institutions, to fight to get a place for us. And they expect something from us. Let's not make mockery of their struggle and their legacy. Thank you so much. Um, we are out of time. I would say there, there are several questions uh, in the chat and the Q&A that we won't uh, be able to address because we're, we're out of time. But again, thank all the, the uh, uh, attendees and thank you for your questions. Uh, special thanks to Madam Secretary Weber uh, for your powerful comments. Really thank you for your time. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Brenda Stevenson, Professor Cheryl Harris, and Professor Devin Cabado. Thank you for your powerful remarks. Obviously, this is just at uh, the beginning of, of I think, many uh, discussions, and then hopefully UCLA, uh, all of us have a direct connection to, <laughs> will be able to uh, play an important role, uh, and hopefully in the Ralph Bunch Center and the Department of African American Studies as well, uh, to push forth that vision that um, that you have with respect to the university's involvement and UC's involvement more general. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, attendees.